Leo Strauss was one of the most important political philosophers and classicists of the last century. To his critics, he is the bugaboo guy who is the dark mastermind of American imperialism and neoconservatism, even though such conspiracy theories have been thoroughly debunked within academic studies, even by academics who are very far to the left in their politics. To his students and his defenders within academic study, Strauss was a great exegete who brought Plato, Thucydides, Al-Farabi, and Machiavelli to life for a generation of political theorists who had been cut off from anything written prior to Thomas Hobbes. Strauss brought back into academic study and to intellectual life the consideration of the insights of the classical political tradition shunned by the modern political science of post-Hobbesianism. Part of Strauss's fame was his elaboration on the Western dynamic caught up by two cities and the concepts that they represented. For Strauss, the Western tradition cannot be lifted out of the indissoluble tension between rationalism and revelation, symbolized by the cities of Athens and Jerusalem. The Athenian rationalist tradition of philosophy for Strauss was cutthroat, pragmatic, and suffered from a tension between hubris and realism. The Jerusalemite revelatory tradition, by contrast, was moralistic, zealous, but also suffered the tension of hubris and realism, albeit for different reasons. One need only look at the long history of Jewish and Christian messianic movements for how faith could be as equally hubristic as an aspirational form of political apotheosis. Strauss never believed that there was a peaceful coexistence between reason and revelation. Instead, reason and revelation were at war with each other. This violent dynamic, and it was a violent dynamic, between Athens and Jerusalem was later mediated through the Catholic Church when it ascended to prominence in Western culture. But that mediation was eventually broken in the Renaissance by men like Machiavelli and the Protestant Reformation, although that mediation was already facing problems, again in the time of the Renaissance, and from deep within the Catholic tradition with men like Augustine who had separated the city of man from the city of God. What Strauss was trying to emphasize here, contrary people like Ben Shapiro today, was that the true genius of the Western dynamic was not in a marriage of reason and revelation, not in a marriage of Athens and Jerusalem, but actually in a quarreling conflict between the two. It was the conflict between philosophical rationalism and theological revelation that produced the great spirit of Western civilization. Central to Strauss's thesis, then, on the Western dynamic is the theologico-political problem. What is the theological-political problem? Basically, it's asking the question, what comes first? God or the polis? God or the state? God or government? To where do our devoted loyalties orient themselves? The city of the white rose, the city of God, or the city of man with its deified lawgiver like Lycurgus, Solon, or Numa, or in the American context, the Founding Fathers and Abraham Lincoln. This is the tension, the true tension, between Athens and Jerusalem. The highest good in life for the Greeks was political life, hence how Aristotle eventually writes in his book The Politics 
that man is a political animal. The highest good in life for Jews and Christians was the theological and contemplative life of the intellect, the soul, focusing on metaphysics, ontology, aesthetics, and ultimately, for the Christian, morality, love itself. What is love? And the Christian theological tradition eventually found support among a handful of Greek philosophers who maintained that intellectual contemplation and politics were compatible, namely Plato and Aristotle, but it must be made clear here that the Christian revision of Plato and Aristotle is exactly that, a grand revision. Plato and Aristotle are not actually advocating that you go into a monastery or teach in a school in the way we kind of fantasize and romanticize Plato as having done. They actually advocate the study of intellectual things so that you can have a life involved in politics. We must never forget that Plato attempted to be an advisor to political kings in his own life and that Aristotle was a tutor to Alexander the Great. This division is significant and in the world of political struggle between the contemplative life being the highest good in life or political life being the highest good in life can have serious consequences when contemplating the fall of civilization in an isolated monastery or in the streets of political struggle. Despite this irreconcilable difference between Athens and Jerusalem, Strauss maintained that the dynamism and the greatness of the West was in the dialectic between these two antagonistic traditions. When Athens often veered into hubris, Jerusalem, so to speak, was there to reel it back in. When Jerusalem veered into hubris, Athens, so to speak, was there to reel it back in. The medieval conflict between the popes and Holy Roman emperors, the Guelph Ghibelline conflict, embodied this dynamic of conflict. The outcome of this tension between reason and revelation is compromise, and the population at large benefits from such compromise between the forces of political fanaticism, Athens, and religious zeal, Jerusalem. What Athens gave to the West was political and military ingenuity, daring progress and the arts, as Strauss wrote. What Jerusalem gave to the West was contemplative, intellectual, and spiritual discipline, a yearning for heavenly things, and a deep anthropology that contributed to the study of nature, human nature, and created an important place for intellectual contemplation as a serious and noble pursuit in of itself instead of intellectual pursuit for pragmatic and political ends as it was with the Greek philosophers. These two forces produced a schizophrenic civilization and human person, but we have all benefited from this dynamic tension between pure politics and contemplative theological philosophy. For instance, the great treasures of Western art and culture are the byproduct of this tension between Athens and Jerusalem wrestling with one another. The other famous distinction or dialectic Strauss drew was between the classics and the moderns, which was best found in his great work and his most famous work, Natural Right and History. Here, the classical and Christian traditions were allied, but allied only because they shared a basic anthropology that humanity was primarily social in nature and had a teleology to it. While the Greco-Romans and Christians differed 
in great, particular, in great particularities, Strauss noted that it was primarily the Catholic tradition of science and philosophy that kept this disparate vision of Athens and Jerusalem united under the principle of the common good and common understanding of human nature, though never a common or universal culture. Contrary popular misinformation, the modern project was a complete break from Greek philosophy and not its resurrection. Any undergraduate in philosophy, and especially political philosophy, would know this. Yet, paradoxically, in breaking from the Greek philosophical tradition, modernity was also a return to an aspect of the Greek philosophical tradition, namely the pre-Socratic tradition of materialist sophistry. While Strauss saw Machiavelli as a forerunner, the culmination of this return to empty materialism and self-preservation as the highest purpose in life is found in Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza. Yet, although the classical liberals drew inspiration from the pre-Socratics, they still broke decisively and tremendously from the Greek philosophical tradition, largely because of a philosopher and statesman by the name of Francis Bacon. Bacon's philosophy of the new science, of scientific conquest, gave the new materialism of modernity a potency and power that was unknown to the pre-Socratic philosophers of the ancient Greek world. Where modern philosophy deeply differed from pre-Socratic materialism was in the belief that science, industry, power, and commerce gave man the ability to completely transform and change nature. In a dazzling exegesis of the so-called classical liberals, Strauss highlights how their philosophical outlook is premised on relativism, hedonism, and solitary and atomistic individualism. In rejecting a summum bonum, a high good in life, the classical liberals decisively destroyed the possibility of unity in any society. In promoting hedonism, or lack of bodily harm, as the highest good in life, if we can even call it that, the classical liberals turned everyone into a robotic copy of each other, destroying all distinctive particularities to life. Hence, how liberalism produces a monoculture, the universal culture of scientific consumerism. In considering humans asocial and solitary creatures, the classical liberals denied the possibility of political virtue in its Greco-Roman form, centered around patriotism and political virtue, a willingness to fight and die for one's country or city, and also denied the possibility of a common good, as found in Christianity, where service to neighbor was understood to be an expression of the love of God. Life in the state of nature, as we know from reading the classical liberals, was terrible. Even in Locke, who was nothing more than the wolf Hobbes in sheep's clothing, as Strauss described him, the classical liberal paradox to the solution of the brutish and short life in the state of nature was the imposition of the Leviathan, the state, over all who came under the tentacles of the social contract. Locke goes as far as to state that part of the responsibility of government is to, quote, decide the rights of subjects by promulgated standing laws and known authorized judges. Locke is hardly the benign libertarian he is made out to be on the internet by people who have never read him or clearly haven't understood him. After all, his rosy state of nature necessarily descends into the state of war, which compels us out of the primal state of existence and into a social contract state. 
Conflict defines an atomized society in a war over the scarcity of resources. Thus, Strauss shows, after many close and intense readings of Francis Bacon, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, and others, that the logical conclusion of the modern liberal vision moves to, quote, the outlawry of war or the establishment of a world state, end quote. How prescient, all things considered, especially since Strauss was writing this in the 1950s. Even Locke's political logic, as Strauss shows, is the slow growth of statism. The more rights one has, the more power the state must have to enforce those rights against others by promulgating standing laws and known authorized judges and through the power of the legislature, a legislature that Locke describes as sacred and unalterable. Now one might say, what about the right of revolution in Locke? You have the wrong understanding of what Locke means by revolution. We must remember that the first usage of the term revolution was in science to describe the rotation of the stars and the planets. When Locke writes about the right to revolution, he is not saying you have a right to overthrow your government. It is because the government has made itself null and void and no longer actually exists because it has abandoned its duty to the social contract that we must revolve. We must revolt and revolve back and return to a social contract government. Life without a government is miserable. It is a state of war. The right to revolution in Locke is actually the necessity to have government in our life when our original social contract government has proven itself incapable of upholding the social contract that it's supposed to uphold. The crisis of modernity is, therefore, one of permissive nihilism in combination with growing totalitarian statism. With nothing to call citizens up toward beside comfortable living, the gains won by democracy in the 20th century would be threatened by competitors. It was threatened by fascism, but managed to survive in winning the Second World War. And this crisis brought, up, brought on to democracy by fascism was something that Strauss gave focus on in his lecture on German nihilism in 1941 during the high watermark of the Second World War. In Strauss's time, liberal democracy was in struggle with communism after winning in 1945. From Strauss's perspective, communism offered humanity something to be zealous for and strive to achieve. Liberalism, not so much. This would, in turn, Strauss feared, lead to non-communist young adults embracing communism because the aspirational communism that they were trying to achieve was far more alluring and compelling than the empty hedonism of liberal democracy. Strauss wanted to avoid this possibility because he was also warning that communism would always be far more despotic, tyrannical, and totalitarian than democracy with all its faults could ever be. Strauss was not an anti-liberal in the manner that Strauss's critics and conspiracy theorists ignorantly and erroneously charge, leaving one to wonder if they've ever bothered to read him. On the contrary, he was a friend to democracy. He believed that democratic states, for all their metaphysical and philosophical problems, of which there are many, still retain the spirit of classical Athens and acceptance of spiritual matters and religion, even if in a much more depreciated form, in the promise of freedom of religion, and therefore the spirit of Jerusalem, even though it was much depreciated, was still within the polity of democracy. Despite the problems of liberalism, Strauss believed 
that rejuvenating liberal polities with classical virtue ethics would safeguard it from slipping into nihilistic tyranny and from losing the contest that it was waging against communism. In a world where tyranny was everywhere, liberalism, while in the danger of slipping into its own tyranny, also had the most freedom to allow people to embrace and in that embrace hopefully be filled with the spirit of patriotic defense against those tyrannical and totalitarian forces that threatened to destroy it. Strauss's hope then was that a recovery of classical ideals and virtue would bolster the liberal democratic states from within to help them overcome their own inherent and implicit nihilism and hedonism and to confront the totalitarian challenge of communism. This ability was only possible, of course, in liberal polities precisely because of their relative openness and their willingness to extend hands of compromise to many different groups of people. Strauss was, in fact, a great friend and supporter of American democracy and was deeply concerned about what would happen if the world of American democracy decayed, degenerated, and failed to remain steadfast in its opposition to more authoritarian opponents. In his essay, The Three Waves of Modernity, Strauss charted the tripartite struggle for modernity as an ideological one. Conservatism need not apply because conservatism was pre-modern and anti-ideological. The contenders in modernity were liberalism, including many who now go by the label conservative in today's world, socialism or communism, and fascism. Liberalism was marked by the discovery of humanity's mastery over nature through technology, or what we call science, in the 21st century. The essence of liberalism was to create safe, pleasant, and harmless lives through the instruments of the new science. The purpose of science is reinterpreted for the relief of man's estate, for the conquest of nature, for the maximum control, the systematic control of the natural conditions of human life. Conquest of nature implies that nature is the enemy, a chaos to be reduced to order. Everything good is due to man's labor rather than to nature's gift. Nature supplies only the almost worthless materials of life. Accordingly, the political society is in no way natural. That is Strauss's description of the essence of liberalism. Liberalism is all about man's use of science and technology to wage a war against nature, to transform nature, to create a world of prosperity. Furthermore, Strauss writes in reflecting over the movement of modern political ideology, I can here only assert that the increased emphasis on economics is a consequence of this. Eventually, we arrive at the view that universal affluence and peace is the necessary and sufficient condition of perfect justice. If that sounds a lot like the politics of liberalism today, you'd be correct. Everything is about the creation of justice through affluence and peace brought forth by the power of technology and science. That is all that truly matters. Everything becomes economics. Everything is reduced to economism. Everything else in life doesn't actually matter. The materialization of life 
and the triumph of scientific economism was the first outcome of modernity, the so-called first wave of modernity. It was reacted against by the second wave, or what we'd simply know as socialism. The head of the second wave was the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as much a modernist as any of the other Enlightenment philosophers before him, contra that idiot Steven Pinker, who doesn't think Rousseau is an Enlightenment philosopher. Yes, he is. Rousseau protested, it is true, on the behalf of nature, but he protested on behalf of nature more than he did, but he protested on behalf of human nature also more than he did the green trees and flowery pastures interrogated on the rack of post-Baconian science. As Strauss writes, Rousseau protested in the name of virtue, of the genuine non-utilitarian virtue. If liberalism was about remaking the world to make humanity's consumeristic life pleasurable and peaceful, socialism also concurred with liberalism in this regard, hence why so many liberals just become socialists. The two movements are bitter enemies because they actually agree on the basic premise of what life is about. They agree on the same end, that universal affluence and peace is the necessary and sufficient condition of perfect justice. The difference is that socialism disagreed with liberalism with the means to that end. The best way to simply understand this in economic terms is the first wave of modernity, liberalism, believed that the power of industry, commerce, and capitalism, capitalism being the key here, would bring forth the world of universal affluence and peace, and hence perfect justice. The second wave of modernity, socialism, drawn from Rousseau, believed it was necessary for human beings to come back together in some sort of virtuous community. Hence, it would be socialism, wealth redistribution, that would lead to universal affluence and peace, and thus perfect justice. According to Strauss, the discovery of the second wave of modernity was the dissolution of the positive normative or the is-ought distinction that defines realist philosophy. Liberals, especially in their classical form, often preach realism, and we still see this in our world today. Is that practicable? Socialists, by contrast, are often demeaned, perhaps rightly so, as starry-eyed idealists. But it is their idealism that makes them distinct from the liberal realists who preceded them. We are no longer living in the world of is ought. We are simply living in the world of ought. We ought to live in this world. We shouldn't ask whether it is possible. The asking of that question whether it is possible destroys the very possibility of ought. Hence why socialism always becomes a totalitarian movement, according to Strauss. We must live in this world. This ought to be the world we live in. No alternatives are allowed to enter into that discussion. But the dissolution of the is-ought distinction is because of the power of science in combination with humanity's moral agency, which could allow for the creation of a world that ought to be the world of universal affluence and peace. If human nature was about self-preservation for the end of non-harm and peaceful, affluent economic consumption, then that world is what ought to be made manifest. The is-ought distinction is completely vanished now. What is 
is what ought to be. Technology and science made this all possible. If you reject to be part of this project, if you reject to be part of the scientific socialism that will create the perfect world, you will be forcibly made to journey into that better world. As Rousseau himself said in the social contract, whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be constrained to do so by the whole body, which means nothing other than that he shall be forced to be free. What a fun paradoxical and even contradictory statement there. You will be forced to be free. You will be forced into this perfect world, even if you don't think it's possible, even if you don't want to be part of it. You will be dragged into this new world. The world of freedom, through the mastery and transformation of nature, is the only world we should be striving to create. Socialism's moral nature is what stood in opposition to classical liberalism's moral relativism. That is the true distinction between socialism and liberalism, according to Strauss, because socialism and liberalism are basically two sides of the same coin. Liberalism declares that through science, technology, and commerce, we can achieve the mastery of nature and transform the world to universal peace and affluence the world of perfect justice. Socialism takes from liberalism that entire premise, hence scientific socialism. But what socialism critiques within liberalism is its relativism. Hence, socialism takes on the moral zeal that was lost to classical liberalism, which is one of the reasons why in the late 20th and 21st century, as Strauss was even hinting at, the spirit of Jerusalem, religion, and theology seems to be channeled into socialism within societies that have lost all connection with the divine, with traditional Christianity. While there were some religious socialists within history, most socialists have been and remain today anti-clerical, atheistic, and opponents of societal religion, yet they are filled with the moral spirit of Jerusalem. The classical liberals in their Athenian materialism were the true heirs of Athens. The new dialectic of Athens and Jerusalem was between the cutthroat materialism of Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke against the sentimental materialism of Rousseau and his heirs, especially the Romantics. Then Strauss reached his elaboration on fascism, the third wave of modernity, which was the cruelest of all the modern ideologies. Fascism was defined by the, quote, experience of terror and angru anguish rather than of harmony and peace, and it is the sentiment of historical existence as necessarily tragic, end quote. Perpetual struggle was what would bring humanity happiness. Herd life, the life of the last men, was simply to have a full stomach and a, worm, a warm bed to retire to at night and to sleep in. To the fascist, this is the emptiness of modernity. This is the emptiness of the modern world, a world without any ideals and aspirations. Because you have to ask yourself, if you're a socialist, you may have something to strive for right now, but once you achieve your goal, is there anything to be aspirational about anymore? Are we simply trying to live in a world well-fed, well-clothed, well-housed, well-medicated by ordinary physicians and by psychiatrists. Strauss realized, as he wrote, that the true and seductive allure of fascism was in its perpetuation of a metaphysics of eternal conflict.
We will always be at war. And that is what makes life intoxicating. The danger of fascism was through its synthetic combination of the discoveries of the first two waves of modernity. From liberalism, fascism took the cult of technology and science to new levels of repression, interrogation, and control. From socialism, fascism took over the dissolution of the is-ought distinction and, with the power of technology in the hands of the ubermensch, the brave new world of the scientific technological utopia could be made real. The purpose of life was the struggle to make that world a reality since nature and technology called for a world of control to be established. Fascism also drew on the modern science of its own time, biology, hereditary science, and evolution, all of which confirmed the fascist idea that life was perpetual struggle and war. What was evolution but the war of all against all? What is biology but the war of genes against genes to make sure certain genes are passed on and the ones that don't have been defeated, destroyed, and go into extinction? Hence, fascism doesn't actually really imagine a perfect world like socialism does. It is stuck in the world of forever conflict, forever war. Hence why fascism, of course, went to war. It has to go to war. For life is nothing but war. And everything that exists serves the purpose of war. Life, science, technology, economics, culture, education, everything serves the purpose of conflict. In this contest of ideologies, fascism had fallen with its defeat in 1945. At the time of Strauss's death, liberalism and socialism were all that remained. From Strauss's point of view, socialism could have still emerged as the victor when he died in 1973. The ever-present threat of a socialist victory in the ideological wars of modernity and the slow-growing nihilism and relativism that lay at the heart of liberalism was something Strauss was extensively and intensely concerned with. The importance of Strauss for many in the present is in his exceptional classical scholarship and his recognition that in liberalism lay a deep relativism that would exhaust itself into permissive nihilism and the growth of a state of absolute and total control. The collapse of moral norms would divide society which was, united, which was unified by the force of law under the social contract. With no more external enemy to threaten liberalism, liberalism's internal contradictions would prove to be its own worst threat. Without the great external foe, liberal polities would grow politically impotent as society relativized itself and liberal states became impotent to act on anything. Contemporary Straussians, then, tend to be virtue ethicists. They believe in the importance of, classic, of the classical conception of virtue, either in its Greco-Roman or Catholic flavor, as the great buttress against relativized disintegration. Strauss follows the classical theorists who, in assessing the decline of classical Greece, latched onto the idea of moral softness and materialism as the primary cause for their degeneration into tyranny, civil war, and eventual conquest, despite their wealth and large militaries, to comparatively poorer entities, Macedon, and eventually Rome. Strauss, who knew Oswald Spengler's thesis in Decline of the West, even references Spengler directly in his seminal essay, The Three Waves of Modernity, Fearing that without virtue in political life, the eventual political impasse of an increasingly decadent, relativistic, and nihilistic West 
would leave itself open to the return of the politics of force, tyranny, in which the formerly relatively free and open polities of the West would slip into despotism. Spangler argued that in the, the final descent of the West, politics would become so untenable, so demoralized, so ridden with conflict, that force, political force, would be the only answer to all of our political problems. Caesarism, the rule of the tyrant or the Caesar, was the future because Caesarism always coincides with political and cultural decadence. And this is precisely what Strauss feared and was warning against. We must remain virtuous enough to avoid falling into our own tyranny because of our own relativistic impotence. The victory of modernity, the victory of civilization, is that we simply live and then die alone in a warm bed with three meals a day provided by the state. There is no striving, there is no goal, there is no telos for humanity to consummate. If we live comfortable, peaceful, and pleasant lives, we have won the game of life according to the new science ideology of modernism. Strauss thought this mentality would eventually become problematic. Those who present Strauss as some sort of closet fascist, although he clearly never was if you actually bothered to read him, a synthetic philosopher of rationalism and religion, even though again he never was one, a reactionary, even though again he never was one, or an opponent of liberalism, even though as we've clearly been explaining in this lecture, he really wasn't, simply have not read him or portray him deliberately so in a deceptive and misleading way to achieve their own purposes, and probably to grind their own axes. In concentrating on classical natural right and the philosophers and historians of Athens, like Plato, Aristotle, and Thucydides, we begin to see the kind of intellectualism that Strauss advocates, a return to the virtue rationalism of Athens and not the moral revelation of Jerusalem. And why is this? There is a kernel of moral virtue, of philosophical moralism, deep within the rationalism of Athenian philosophy, classical, natural, right, and moral duty. And that, Strauss was arguing, is the only path amenable to moderns who need saving from their own apathetic nihilism and the totalitarian moralism of socialism.